Bill Rudder is, was not only a extremely successful and uh, accomplished professor at UCSF, but was really a pioneer in biotechnology. Uh, it's wonderful to see him again, and I really look forward to hearing what he has to say. Bill? Thank you very much, Tom. You know, the last time I was on the campus of University of Colorado when I saw Tom just before the publication of Ribozymes, <laughs> and I was exhilarated by that meeting, and I'm exhilarated by this meeting in several ways, not only by the talks that have been given today, but um, uh, by being together ag again with Larry, whom I've known for 40 years, and find an increasingly convergence of our ideas about uh, how to impact um, healthcare by technology. And today I want to, to talk uh, essentially about a, a generalized approach to affecting healthcare using a collaboration of all devices and other information to provide information uh, itself which can be valuable to the person and, and also to the professional. This is really based on the idea that metrics count, that metrics, both in the qualitative and quantitative sense, determine actionable information. Gratuitous ideas count for nothing unless they are converted to metrics in some way. And I'd say that most of the progress depends upon the facility with which you can use metrics. And the movement of medicine toward more progressive aspects of personal medicine and medicine practice itself, I believe, are really driven by that aspect of metrics. So, I think that's going to move, but it's not moving. Maybe, maybe this is going to move. Okay. <laughs> So, so some, of my better t <laughs> some of my better talks have been given without slides. <laughs> How about this? Maybe press over on this. Maybe this one. Okay. So a presumptuous title, for sure. I want to start about it, uh, thinking about its global uh, relevance. About six months ago, uh, a financial consultant who used to be uh, one of the high-level consultants of Morgan Stanley, um, wrote an article about the, as you can see, the decline of an empire, the empire being in the United States. Andy Shea worked in Singapore and was, um, <coughs> was fired from his job because he described the corruption which existed in India, uh, which was essentially uh, putting a cap on progress in that country. They, uh, India was a very uh, good client of CNN at the time. And he became a consultant, and this article is one of his articles. <coughs> he points out, uh, roughly, that th the demise of the US uh, are due to three factors. One is an over-investment in <coughs> in um, the, the, the defense army. Second, the ineffectual use of, uh, and multiple use of uh, pensions. And third is healthcare. And as you can see from this quote, he believes that healthcare in the United States is the dominant among these. And that if we don't uh, fix this issue, fundamentally the US is toast with respect to its position in the world. The point that I felt uh, was extremely uh, powerful in this was the fact that the additional spend, 17% of GDP on healthcare, which is roughly twice that of other developed countries with similar results, is roughly equal to the U.S. fiscal def def deficit and twice as much as the trade deficit. That sort of puts into in perspective 
by, uh, in my view, the seriousness of the issue as we're going forward. But fundamentally, the issue in the United States is not solely related to the United States, but the healthcare issue exists in every country of the world. And if the, if the religious political complexes which exist don't kill us, the competition of the various societies in the world will depend on their ability to solve the nutrition health problem. This issue is so common to every individual that exists on the world that if we can get it right in this area, both by providing technology and useful technology to many places in the world, the ascendance of, uh, of our uh, society will extend way beyond the technical domain into the political domain. And I think that quite seriously. So um, the sad fact is that innovation which has occurred doesn't decrease costs, it increases costs. And why is that due? Well, it's in part due to the fact that the FDA measures uh, effectiveness by an increase in lifespan, even if it's only, as I heard recently, 30 seconds. <laughs> A true comment. The second is that complicated drug regimens, now multiples, simply stack up the costs on treatment with a progressive increase, but without sterilization, for example, of, of, the, of the virus uh, infection. Devices become ever more complicated, and specialized personal services in the context of surgeries are more elegant and wonderful, but they're also complicated and costly. So, um, Things are changing, but changing slowly. We're moving toward, I hope, fee for value. A number of things up here. But the issues of, of uh, promoting wellness and preventing illness, the prevention aspect, is poorly developed in our society. And the mitigation of the chronic diseases that we've been talking about today, metabolic diseases of various sorts, along with infections, infectious diseases, are still increasingly costly and complicated. And finally, the integration of information services which drives public information and medical information is uh, largely occluded in domains as opposed to being freely available. So it's clear that we need another method of, of handling this. And to some extent, uh, the, uh, the strategies that Simon talked about work in one area but we need a comprehensive solution to this problem which aggregates all information and is available to the patient as well as the doctor to the extent that they can use it. So, uh, as you all know, we have perverse incentives against efficiency now. Uh, the efforts to reduce costs have not been successful. And we believe that people themselves are the agent which will be drivers. There's, there's too much inculcation into the businesses of medicine and medical practice and the institutions, the insurance institutions that support it to effectively drive change rapidly, as rapidly as it's needed. So uh, what are the issue, issues that face us? Well, if we think that a major issue is professional labor, how can we disintermediate intermediate that? Well, it's available, aside from the economics, high costs, the availability of care by other dimensions can do so. In so doing, we have to make it effective at the individual level and uh, at, an, at an issue which is both efficient and, and reliant and in which there's communication with the professionals in the field. Clearly, if we're thinking of uh, personal medication, besides do not harm, 
we have to establish a means for self-directed care, uh, which, uh, first of all, is based on uh, real information, information which can be uh, updated in as much as possible in real time and in a means that is effective for the individual. If we take a look at one area, cardiovascular disease, as you know, there are strategies involving medication and diet and exercise and, and uh, avoidance of, of expensive interventions. But when it comes to compliance with these, they're modest, extremely modest, Un amazingly modest, in fact. So for us, the conclusion is that those kinds of incentives uh, are not sufficient. We've got to ha have multiple approaches which involve, in our view, metrics, clear information, the use of social uh, uh, activities with all the support groups that are possible, along with uh, facilitation of the sort that uh, Dr. Smith talked about uh, this morning. That information is what we want to direct our attention to. And with it, we have to quantitate measure the success in these terms. Along those lines, some time ago, we created a company almost a decade ago to deal with information transfer, realizing, first of all, that all the devices which are available to individuals use different electronic readouts. So it was impossible to congregate uh, all uh, the information and deconvolute it in such a way that the person could use it, <laughs> let alone the doctor, who also didn't have the ability to deconvolute. So we, there was a technology that was available uh, to essentially deconvolute all of that stuff in the server. So the problem simply represented a communication of the device to the server, the deconvolution, the, the re-sending uh, of that information back to the patient and also uh, to uh, the healthcare provider. And today, uh, in the most uh, recent version of this company, Numera, has uh, now a an ability to facilitate that information, gathering information from any device. We now have about 70 devices that are uh, immediately activated by this through a, ga a gateway which operates through a cell phone, uh, through a computer, through hubs in the home which integrate all the information from the home and uh, through uh, specialized devices. And on the other end, we have a social platform which operates uh, through which operates uh, through Facebook or an alternative that's like Facebook but doesn't involve Facebook for those who don't want to deal with Facebook. <laughs> and in, these, in this context, we're trying to provide an overall solution that is available and can be used uh, by populations. In addition to all the devices which are out there, there is uh, one significant development that which we've taken on ourselves, a device, a mobile platform, which allows uh, the integration of all of those wherever you are and however you want it. This is called Blue Libris. It's a small, uh, it's a small device about the size of, pe of a large pendant. You could wear it um, on a chain or on your belt, whichever. And it acts as, a, as an instrument with real-time connections via the telephonic circuit to anyone who needs to know in real time. So for patients who um, should be monitored, for whatever reason. It's an automatic communication. It also allows independently an alert for a patient that is uh, specifically wishes to uh, 
communicate. It, it has a complicated series of technologies inside, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, and so on, which allows the assessment of movement in real time. So you can deconvolute walking, running, falling, whatever movement, along with sound. And that relationship between the movement and sound allows one to address multiple functions in a uh, congregated way. It allows us to, uh, on the one hand, uh, for the fitness-oriented person, to have a rather specific calculation of energy that is, transfer, trans, um, that is undergone by the individual. It allows us to take care of uh, a child who is running in the forest and his mother wants to pay attention to where the child is and what that child, uh, maybe the child falls or is injured. It allows one to worry about, um, for example, uh, drug compliance because uh, you can hear the sound of an opening cap on a drug bottle. So there are a large number of the issues associated with personal um, management of health, which are all communicated through this mobile device. And there are standard other devices which uh, exist that I mentioned before. So we're exceedingly excited about this program. Now the bad side about it is that this thing has been going for 10 years and uh, we've carried out innumerable studies and we continue to do studies. Everybody in the business loves this stuff and they want to do another pilot. And the insurance companies, the providers, the uh, individual hospitals, group hospitals. We had a program with British Telecom that started uh, seven years ago. And this was to address the needs of the National Health Service. We're going to provide this kind of information to the National Health Service. It started out with a certain flamboyance and uh, it's lost its flamboyance and certainly has gone nowhere. Now independently, these in, in recent years, thank God, and in particularly in the last two, things have changed. And now uh, we can see a dynamic which is both hopeful and uh, we're really quite enthusiastic about the moment. But it's been a struggle and the rate of uptake has been excruciatingly slow. But now the technology is driving and uh, th there are segments of the population, uh, in particular the elderly, which need to take, uh, get taken care of, the fitness-oriented people, etc., where there is a driving force and we hope will uh, drive the whole uh, mechanism. We're exceedingly happy uh, that we were able to recruit the managing director of Microsoft's health care business. Microsoft has a $2 billion business in healthcare, believe it or not. Not, not very intrusive into healthcare, but providing information about healthcare. And they have what's called a health vault, as some of you know, for the, rep uh, for the um, deposition of healthcare information. It's a one-way lockbox, essentially. But Tim Smokoff and his group have dramatically changed both the technology and the dynamics of, of this enterprise uh, within the last year and a half, and we're just super delighted now about the status. Now at the other end, well, let me just continue with the social aspect. About 18 months ago, we got uh, committed to the notion if anything was going to move this, because the formally developed um, industry was not moving very fast, social might. So we developed a social platform and it has within it the capability of communicating in a social dimension 
all aspects of community organization. And our strategy in this, uh, in this domain was a little bit different than Cindy Malone's this morning. It was driven by the concept uh, and the firm belief that competition drives behavior. Most of us in this room are competitive, I believe. And certainly, it's true for me. If there's not competition, the progress moves slowly. Whether it's a war, as discussed in the la by the last speaker, or whether it's another kind of war, intellectual war, against ignorance or by real competition, things move in competition. And my belief is that competition requires metrics. So the, the Facebook or the social dimensions, which just involve verbal communication, you know, well, okay, that has what it has. Uh, but uh, once you bring in quantitation and a competition aspect, then you can begin to drive real information and hopefully this will have, us have some change. So all of this uh, social dimension is driven by a metric, uh, a, a metric oriented uh, program. Maybe I, maybe I need. <laughs> <laughs> so another aspect about um, a coupled program is the provision of information related to uh, health status. And my interest in, thanks. I have the flat ear syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> this interest in diagnostics, uh, particularly consumer-oriented diagnostics, uh, began when Chiron was in the diagnostic business. And um, the, the driving force in that business was the discovery of proprietary diagnostics for, by cloning HIV, hepatitis C, and HPV. And that subset of compounds uh, drove the essentially the elimination of those viruses from the blood supply. And there are 50 million units of blood used every year. And in 1975, 25% of people who got a blood transfusion in Sacramento got hepatitis B. And others unknown at that time got hepatitis C. So there was a big aspect of the use of uh, diagnostics and essentially uh, of prevention of disease. And the quantitation associated with that um, was the biggest problem we faced. The medical community at that time and the pharmaceutical community didn't believe in viral load, the quantitation of viral information. It was all done by cell culture. There was a semi-quantitative, -quanti uh, really qualitative analysis. So you could get plus minus. But as soon as it became available to quantitatively measure viruses, then that led to uh, all the consequences, not just protection of the blood supply, but the development of vaccines where those, those were possible. And it allowed the development of viral uh, drugs, all dependent upon metrics. In fact, I believe the biggest contribution of, uh, of my colleagues and I at Chiron were the, uh, with this issue of viral load. That, uh, during that time period, at an AIDS meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, we handed out 5,000 CDs that dealt with the information associated with HIV. They were gone in the morning. And we got innumerable requests from individuals, 
governments, et cetera. How do we manage this population? The information flux was essentially unmanageable and unknowable by that group of people. The light went on. Information and the transmission of it was crucial to any field and particularly crucial to new ones. So we set up an informatics group and, and sooner or later it became evidence that, uh, evident to me that the, what I call the big iron instruments, which we used to sell for 250K to 500K, were not where the, uh, were, were not where the music was. The music was uh, where people could get at it uh, quickly. It was also obvious at that time the people who had in, in these infections were intensely interested in the subject. I remember a conversation with one of our colleagues at Stanford um, who was treating hepatitis C at the time, <coughs> who said, you know, my patients know more about this disease than my colleagues do. Again, using infectious disease as a model, but transposing it to any other aspect of human disease, you see that interest and uh, communication of good information is intensely interesting uh, to, to the population. So uh, as time went on, the notion was, gee, we have to move this out to the general population where people can get information by themselves as conveniently as possible. And we started doing work. The first aim was China or India. Uh, why China or India? Well, I knew that at that time the spread between cost and benefit was of crucial interest to both China and India. What I didn't know was the cost factor became such uh, an issue, I soon knew, uh, that people were buying infected blood uh, because it was cheaper and deliberately infecting people because that enhanced the spread. So uh, that drove my interest in developing these good quality tests in China. Turned out China was more practical than India because of certain um, what are called FARA rules, which preclude foreign operations from effectively entering the, the Indian market. And um, this led then to the notion that we would do research and development largely in the US. We'd establish a Chinese subsidiary to lower the cost of manufacturing and deal with the China market. Now, since that time, the situation in China has changed. They're moving up the quality scale extremely rapidly. Competition is still there. In the part of China, which is on the coast, uh, me medical practice is quite like that in a metropolitan city. But farther west in China, it's still, uh, it's still old days. And p so part of this uh, strategy has been to develop this concept uh, to deal with that environment and progressively develop the systems to enter the US and Europe and Japan. And uh, th the challenges for developing this point of care diagnostic business is, first of all, cost. The strategy here is low cost, high volume. But in practical use, turnaround time is really important for lots of reasons. Accuracy, this is a crucial issue. The reason the point of care business itself has failed in the past is that uh, physicians didn't trust the results, nor did the central lab folks who, in fact, managed that uh, business within the medical center, largely. So we had to overcome uh, that major issue. At the same time, panels went out of 
style about 15 years ago. Panels represented then a, a better solution to a blood draw, but um, I'd say the diagnostic companies got out of sync with the payment companies because they wanted to be, get paid for every diagnostic in the panel. That couldn't be justified, so the panels disappeared. On the other hand, the cost of making a panel is roughly the cost of making a single analyte in that panel. So if the panel is of greater value and you're interested in selling, this, this becomes a, uh, another aspect of uh, differentiation between you and the other folks. So it's a requirement, we think, to have panels. And if we heard today, panels are going to be necessary in deconvoluting complex uh, diseases. So <coughs> we have, a, a, I think, a really neat set of qualities. The tests themselves have got a meet or beat central lab sensitivity, multiple tests, da 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 You can read them. And a series of uh, abilities to congregate that information centrally and modulate the, um, the, detailed responses, de de uh, the detailed responses in populations. And for that, we use Numera. So uh, the central instrument, the most recent one that's indicated there, so dealing with large populations for all kinds of activities, the information uh, content availability and the, and the ability to interact with other devices is present in the most uh, recent device. Along with any of the other consumer preferred devices which exist in the community. With multiple connectivity points that we've been talking about before uh, from cell phones to computers to iPads to whatever through uh, a gateway which was cleared some time ago so that we're not practicing medicine, we're transfer transmitting information. So, so we don't have any FDA uh, problems with each individual, um, with each individual, individual test as we go through the process in a whole integrated system with what is now called Numeradet. And then that system is available to any of the other purveyors that are interested in it. The idea is essentially to be an intermediary in the presentation of information, not to solely try to dominate the field ourselves, but to simply integrate ourselves into the other approaches. So it's a totally open system, open at the front end, open at the back end, hopefully that allows it to be most useful to society at large. So uh, Rely itself started uh, uh, a couple of years ago with a six-channel instrument which was quantitative, uh, ability uh, quickly to use serum, plasma, or whole blood. In China especially, at that time, Serum was used routinely. I've come out recently with a mini Relia, with a computer, touch screen, everything we can make for a couple hundred dollars, which has all the availability to transmit that information uh, through any one of the collection devices. And it has a role in many parts of the world. We're most excited about Relia 3, which now has the sensitivity and specificity that eclipses the big iron instruments. We're happy to say it's multiplexable. It um, is quite a remarkable instrument. And we're in just now um, going through the final stages of developing Relia 3. The first the first part in the strategy was to focus on 
public health or primary hospital settings, primarily in China, where they desperately, desperately needed this kind of stuff. Would you believe it that there are 55,000 hospitals in China that don't have diagnostic services? Maybe the richest country of the world. That's, uh, that's as it exists. Uh, the uptake is very rapid in, in China. We're growing 100% a year. And incidentally, uh, the driving factor is not infectious disease. There are a lot of people who are focusing on infectious disease and uh, clearly either at the high end or at the low, low end, the competition is tremendous and Chinese companies are preferred in that sector, except in the very high end hospitals. What is a driver is cardiovascular disease. There are huge numbers of uh, uh <coughs> heart attacks and rapidly growing because of the change in diet. In this area, the Chinese are as interested as people in the West in, pre in distinguishing between a heart attack and cardiovascular disease and gastrointestinal disturbances. So this is um, a driver. How does it play into our strategy? Well, first of all, the, it's a very specific um, and quantitative need for measuring biomolecules which are indicative. But before I tell you that story, <laughs> this, this is how we're developing the business in China. We have a great building with a, a very large GMP facility now oriented toward uh, international markets. And um, this, will, this is going to be our manufacturing facility for China and for the rest of the world. We just inaugurated that, uh, that building last fall, August of last year. And um, we're, um, we're very excited about uh, that dimension. By the way, there's a city fully devoted to medical sciences called the Chinese Medical City. It's the birthplace of Hu Jintao. And it's one of the places in China where you can own land. And thank heaven, we can own some land there. And they're trying to congregate uh, groups from all over the world. And there's, there's a high incentive for going there. So um, first, uh, the focus on mini relia, the instrument we're just bringing this spring. This is what fundamentally uh, low volume, but quantitative measurements where all these compounds can occur, where, the, where it's quantitative, but not the most sophisticated quantitation. For example, for the heart drugs that I talk, talked to you about. This is the instrument we're most proud about. Um, we can still... Uh, um, We can still manufacture this instrument, a highly sophisticated instrument, at low cost compared with the West. It has a full computer on board. Um, it has two lasers. And the secret to its sensitivity is that we use one laser to measure control, the other laser to measure the sample, and measure the ratio between the lasers. So that eliminates must, much of the error in manufacturing. It eliminates the error associated with positioning on uh, the, the strip. And as a result, the sensitivity and specificity is quite remarkable. So integrating all of these factors and putting the great uh, information capability, we have now a, a quite marvelous instrument. And the cost of this instrument is about 1% of what I used to sell a uh, big iron instrument for at Chiron. It can be, uh, it is at such a level that it can be distributed broadly. It's clear waved so that you don't need a sophisticated individual to run it. The test in the United States is the 13-year-old 
can get uh, professional results. That's the way we intend to use it. It operates from a blood prick. The results are about five minutes. So it's within the dwell time of a prospective individual who wants results. But the magic beyond those uh, specific characteristics is the information transfer ability and the ability to congregate full information and its value to the physician or provider, family members, individuals, so you can monitor over time. You can imagine if you can monitor uh, chronic diseases over time by metrics which allow you to uh, uh, track performance. And this helps you whether you're, whether you're working on diabetes and the comorbidities or any other um, such disease. So, so that we're, we're quite happy about the UI. It's, it's quite beautiful to watch, very intuitive, and uh, we think it's going to be quite happy. I mentioned all the rest of these characteristics. So we're focusing right now on the cardiac markers. Why are we focusing on the cardiac markers? It's to deal with this uh, general issue that essentially the medical profession has had the point of care instruments don't give reliable results. So here we've deliberately chosen one where the sensitivity and specificity of the measurement is competitive with, uh, within the industry. And that's with, for cardiac markers. So uh, here represents the, a panel measuring various entities myosin, fatty acid binding protein, CKMB, and troponin I. Troponin I being a component of muscle, the cardiac muscle, and with injury, you get some degradation of this, troponin I accumulates in the serum. And this represents the time course of uh, th these different markers during acute myocardial infarction, an MI, and a coronary syndrome. As you, it turns out that you can discriminate, and if you measure rates over time, you can discriminate exceedingly well. So the system we have allows, has the sensitivity to uh, discriminate and has the rapidity so that you can get multiple instruments, for example, in the emergency room or wherever those uh, measurements need to happen. Now, it goes beyond that in the sense that each of us have a low level of troponin I in our serum. And there, in the, there are in the population mutants in myosin, and the mutants in myosin determine the stability of the cardiac muscle such that we each have a preponderance, a low-level preponderance, but some of us have a, um, <coughs> a more serious preponderance than others. And there's a new company being formed to correlate specific mutations with the levels of CTNI. But suffice it to say that many of, uh, of the most competent athletes uh, are subject to an acute MI, probably related to a mutation in myosin, and monitorable by these uh, very sensitive tests for troponin I. So opens up a market that demonstrates the capability to measure these very, very low levels. Uh, in routinely in a broad population, demonstrate the capability of the instrument and with that overcome what we think is a, a general nervousness about the ability of these instruments to provide uh, real data. So it's a technical strategy coupled with a market strategy we're uh,
quite excited about it. So, that strategy is driving an initial business in China and next year and the year after in the US and Europe. The general idea is, whoops, is after the launch for that first indication, we'll, lo uh, uh, we'll enter the international markets and eventually our aim is to get into medical kiosks where people are. The instrument we have, we think, addresses that, uh, that issue very well. So this represents a, a group of, uh, <clears throat> of tests that we're currently developing and wish to develop in the next uh, year or so. I'll just make a couple of points. One is that one of the acute needs is to measure infectious agents, uh, to detect infectious agents rapidly. And one way to do that is with nucleic acid diagnostics. Uh, currently, the timeline is long and the cost is very high. With new immunological diagnostics, especially with antibodies that are and now uh, discovered by another company in the Synergenics group, UMADS, we can get exquisitely sensitive and specific antibodies to detect viral agents, hepatitis C, uh, HIV, um, a variety of agents. And in that context, begin to focus on flu, another one, guys, be fo uh, focus on quantitative measurement of these viruses in this context. We think we're uni uniquely capable of doing that, and so in that, in that fashion, get a fast analysis for some diseases which would discriminate viral diseases from bacterial diseases and so on. The, in oncology, there are real opportunities now to discover markers which uh, we believe detect a broad range of cancers and in this uh, and we're investigating several at the moment as you know the uh, uh, the tests which now exist have both low sensitivity and low specificity so we're looking for tests which are discriminatory and and detect early cancers uh, predominantly so that these can be monitored. So that essentially gives the summary. We've tried to integrate, uh, in general, the information capture system of Numera broadly, and we hope to be able to use that overall system to uh, complement the activities present, the individual activities that are present in the industry itself and with Relia, open up uh, consumer diagnostics. So thanks a lot.